So we work in a model system, um, but in yeast. Um, this is where we study uh, DNA replication. Here you have a once in a million shot of Hammersmith, our research campus in the sun. It, it happens. We had on Wednesday 24 degrees. So I will yeah, it was very nice, but it only happens uh, once in a blue moon. Anyway, so um, so we, we study uh, DNA replication in budding yeast because replication origins in eukaryotes are fairly poorly understood, um, with the exception of yeast, where genetics were able to identify uh, conserved elements, so an essential A element and important B elements, and um, those two B elements together become essential as well. And that was 92 and that they were defined and they are called autonomously replicating sequences or short R's. Um, so this R's elements uh, represent a binding site for the origin recognition complex. So this origin recognition complex is bound to in chromatin throughout the cell cycle. It consists of six subunits, uh, ORC1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, where two out of those uh, six subunits are ATP binding, but only ORC1 is a real uh, true ATPase. So this origin recognition complex binds to this A uh, uh, element, to this essential A element, an important B1 element. And yeah, that was uh, found in 92. And um, this was in Bruce Stillman's lab, and uh, I joined uh, this lab in 2000 for my postdoc. And then I was working on um, reconstitution of uh, uh, the early stages of DNA replication, and I was working on the origin recognition complex, and at that time we started to look at this origin recognition complex by electron microscopy. So this is the first uh, electron microscopy 3D structure of this complex, uh, and then in 2008 we published a um, um, more advanced study where we mapped individual subunits to this. Uh, um, 3D envelope where from EM you, at least at that time, you couldn't necessarily tell where individual subunits are. And um, then uh, I, my, my real project was focused on CDC6 back then. So CDC6 is a protein that um, binds to the origin in late M phase in um, preparation for DNA, for initiation of DNA replication. So ORC is bound throughout the cell cycle, but CDC6 only at specific cell cycle stages. So CDC6 is a real protein that gets the process going. And I was interested in understanding how it works. So uh, uh, I purified CDC6 and reconstituted ORC CDC6 complex formation. It's an ATP dependent process. It uh, has um, a uh, role in sequence specificity. Um, so ATP hydrolysis is actually required to form the ORC CDC6 complex uh, at the right place. Um, very peculiar mechanism that we worked out. And it changes the structure of ORC. So this is ORC alone. ORC CDC6 gives it a rise to this kind of round shaped structure. And um, yeah, so this is where CDC6 binds. All right, I'll um, be talking more about it in a minute. So what is this ORC CDC6 protein doing? Well, they load the replicative helicase on top of DNA. So that's their function. So the replicative helicase in eukaryotes, the helicase that separates the DNA strands is the MCM protein. So here, shown in green. And um, so ORC CDC6, with the help of uh, accessory protein CD21, recruits this MCM helicase, and then the ATP hydrolysis dependent reaction 
two of those MCM hexamers become loaded in a double hexamer, head-to-head -head double hexamer. And that occurs during M phase and G1 phase. All right. So, um, yeah. MCM is a cause of replicated uh, phenic case. And in so two years, um, uh, so in 2000, late 2006, I moved to London. And then uh, in 2008, we reconstituted this reaction. And then in 2009, we, we, we published the reconstitution. And since then, we have used this assay to do lots of things. And the whole co process is called DNA licensing or pre-replication complex formation, or in short, pre-RC formation. All right. So for a biochemist, this was a fantastic situation because you, you have a highly complex process. You know, you, you have a single binding site for oxidase 6. You know two of those massive MCM um, hexamers on top of DNA. This must involve some opening of the MCM ring, some closing. So uh, it's a fantastic puzzle to, to work on. All right. Um, so this reconstitution showed us that uh, all CDC6, CD1 as a minimal set of proteins required for helicase loading. Uh, we could show that MCM is loaded as a double hexamer around double-stranded DNA, and that was also uh, surprising because in bacteria, you load uh, the helicase, uh, DNA B helicase, uh, as a hexamer on single-stranded DNA, whereas in, in eukaryotes, you load it as a double hexamer on double-stranded DNA. So that's massively different. Um, so if you have a helicase um, that has a job to unwind the DNA sitting on top of double-stranded DNA, you kind of say, well, what kind of helicase is that? How, how, how will that do anything good, right? And um, yeah, I will be coming to that in a minute. Um, it's, um, but I mean, this is an inactive form and it needs activation. Anyway, um, so this double hexamer had a very good thing because it actually explains how you can get bidirectional replication forks because you can easily imagine by activating this thing you can one hexamer can go to one fork and the other hexamer goes to the other fork so it's a very elegant way to uh, get bidirectional replication in one go so from that point of view we were extremely happy with this structure. And yeah, as I already elaborated, the MCM complex is initially inactive and needs to be remodeled for activation. Um, so this remodeling in, um, doesn't exist in, in bacteria. In, uh, it's a truly eukaryotic event. And, and therefore, eukaryotes have many uh, factors that don't exist in bacteria and that are required for this uh, remodeling. And this is something that we only understand very poorly right now. But we know that there are a number of proteins involved. So in the first step of this remodeling event, uh, and it's a kinase process, uh, dependent process, you have the DDK kinase, CDC7, DBF4. You have, uh, get recruitment of a complex containing CDC45, SLD3, with its chaperone SLD7. And then in the second step, in which is um, CDK dependent, a number of additional factors become recruited, um, polymerases and so on. And I don't want you to remember all of those. But what we want to remember is that the end product is a CDC45 MCM genes complex, uh, which is the active form of the helicase. So this is a uh, true helicase that unwinds the DNA adds a replication fork, and many of those other factors get released. All right, um, so I will be talking mostly about helicase loading, a bit about helicase activation also later on. But let's first discuss helicase loading. So how is this regulated in the cell cycle? And um, so, during mitosis, you have a high CDK activity, and that is actually suppressing uh, the loading of the, of the helicase. Only 
in G1 phase, you have a window of opportunity where you have low CDK activity, and this is where you form this pre-RC complex, all right? And then uh, during the G1S transition, you start to increase CDK activity, and this readily uh, phosphorylates the uh, origin recognition complex and also leads to phosphorylation and uh, degradation of CDC6 protein. So with that, you make sure that uh, once you start to replicate DNA, you do not load the helicase again on top of DNA that has been already replicated, otherwise you would get re-replication. If you would get re-replication, all sorts of things could happen. You could have recombination events, uh, and there are um, typical things associated with cancer. All right, and then if everything goes nice, at so at those higher CDK activities, you fire the origins and then you duplicate your DNA and you are happy. So this is all good and fine. And um, what you need to consider is that helicase loading needs to occur at every origin. So in budding yeast, this is 400. In humans, this is 10,000. So at all those different genomic loci, you, know, you need to load the helicase. This is crucial. Okay, so this machine must be quite clever, quite, quite active in doing that, right? So super active machine is doing this at every, every origin. And then you have the problem that in, in, in S phase, helicase loading needs to be 100% inhibited. So 100%, not 99.9, 100%. So you, you, this is the dilemma. You have a highly active reaction, and then you need to inhibit it completely. So, um, and why do you have this complicated mechanism? Well, uh, in bacteria you have a single replication origin, so it's quite easy to, to control origin firing. But if you would have a single origin in a human chromosome, it would take weeks probably for you to duplicate your DNA. So therefore you need multiple replication origins, and therefore you need to have this kind of control system in in place. All right, so now let's think about the scenario, what could go wrong? And my children would tell me everything could go wrong, and that's probably true. Because in, in, in cancer, the typical scenario is you have overexpression of E2F target genes. And what are those? Well, those, all those factors that are involved in helicase loading, they are E2F target genes. So CDC6, CD21, MCM proteins, you name it. Okay, so if we have too many of those, what could happen? Well, what could happen is that you overwhelm this inactivation machinery, and then what could happen is that you load a helicase on top of a piece of DNA that has been already replicated, right? So then this replication, uh, this, this helicase could fire again, could be activated on fire, and then you would have real replication. So that would be uh, definitely very, very bad. Then the other scenario would be, okay, so let's imagine you, if you have too much CDK activity, right? And that's also a typical scenario seen in, in cancer, is you have too much CDK. Then you will struggle to load your helicase, and then you may not actually fire all origins because they never loaded an, uh, uh, the replicative helicase, and then you will only partially duplicate your DNA. In cancer, both of those things happen at the same time. So it's really a deadly cocktail. So um, this is um, a picture produced by the Lasky lab, and they were kind of looking at cancer. So this is normal uh, tissue versus this is cervical cancer, and they stain this for MCM2. And you, you can see there's lots and lots of MCM in there, and I mean, if you would stain for CD6 or CD21, it probably would look very similar. So those are genes that are frequently overexpressed in, in cancer, so that's really, really bad. And people have done now more sophisticated experiments with mouse models and so on and so on. And they just overexpress CDC6 and CD21 together and uh, it, it is highly oncogenic, okay? So 
just having too much of those proteins is, is really bad. And then in cancer, usually you still have on top of that also the misregulation of CDK. So, okay, so this can be all fairly depressing, or you can say, well, at least nowadays those MCN antibodies are used to detect cancer in the clinic, so there's, uh, there's been something positive coming out of all this work. Um, Julian Blow was thinking about this process of helicase loading in the context of, of human proteins, and what he was thinking is, okay, so if you, if you, what would happen if you inhibit helicase loading? So what would happen? Uh, and he, he asked this question in a way that he overexpressed a naturally occurring inhibitor in uh, human cells, in primary human cells. And then what he observed is that this inhibitor, uh, the geminin protein, causes a cell cycle rest because they don't, the cells don't load the helicase and they kind of sense, hmm, I don't have a helicase, so maybe it's better to stop. And he did the same experiment in, in, in a cancer cell line, and what he observed is that those cells, they actually fire their origins, but since they don't have enough loaded of the helicase, they don't fire enough origins, so they actually never finish DNA replication, and then they go with this scenario into mitosis, and what happens is they rip apart the DNA, and they end up in a P53 independent cell death. So that's brilliant, right? I mean, so that means if you can block the helicase in a cancer cell, you can kind of induce uh, cell death, and that's you know, th this is where a lot of people think, oh, th so that may be a useful way to create a drug that could attack cancer, because the normal cells, they, they will rest, and the cancer cell will die. All right, um, then um, in, a, in a very uh, unexpected twist a few years ago, uh, the Andrew Jackson lab reported that this helicase loading factors are actually uh, mutations in those genes, uh, origin of a disease, Meyer-Gorlin syndrome, which is a rare disease, and it causes, well, it causes um, primordial dwarfism, and um, so uh, I think this indicates clearly that those proteins are not only involved in DNA replication, but probably also in de developmental processes. And actually, origin recognition complex is also known to be involved in gene silencing, and there I can see a connection. But yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's an interesting, very interesting observation. It's still not completely understood, obviously. So, okay, so abnormal pre or C formation leads to genomic instability and, and can lead to meyer gorlin syndrome. And uh, our real motivation to study this process is, well, we want to understand the mechanism of action. That this is a super fundamental process, and it's one thing that you just want to know how it works. And then at the same time, you want to look for an Achilles seal. Is there anything, any weak spot that you could target for inhibitors? So the way that we, we study uh, helicase loading is a biochemical, structural, genetic approach. And our, our system uh, involves a DNA, so the biochemical system involves a DNA that contains a replication origin, and this DNA is linked to magnetic beads, and then we have purified proteins. So we have the origin recognition complex, we have CDC6, we have CD21, we have MCM proteins, and if we combine all of those factors on top of the DNA, we get mm, this MCM proteins bound to the DNA. And if we take just one indi individual factor out of the equation, so no DNA or no org, or no CDC6, or no CD21, you don't get the MCM proteins recruited. So it's a highly specific reaction. And then um, you can do a little biochemical trick. You can apply a bit of a high salt wash to the DNA, and that removes 
factors that are associated with the DNA, like the origin recognition complex. But interestingly, the MCM proteins stay behind. Why do they stay behind? Because they encircle the DNA and they can't be washed away. Okay? So, uh, so therefore, this end product of the loading reaction is the MCM double hexamer, and this is high salt stable. All right, um, so we were looking at this MCM double hexamer, and this is uh, a picture, electron microscopy picture of a metal shadowed MCM, actually two MCM double hexamers. This is one, this is the second one, so something like that. And um, yeah, and interestingly, this MCM double hexamer can slide on top of DNA, so um, RNA polymerase can go through the replication origin and push the MCM double hexamer away. And the, you know, there was actually a phenomenon called the MCM paradox, because people were observing MCM proteins at sites where you don't get DNA replication, and they were always very confused, how could that happen? And that's actually an explanation, because you, you, uh, you have this, you load actually at every origin 10 or 20 copies of this MCM double hexamer, and you probably push m most of them away from the replication origin. <coughs> Um, so, yeah, so you load multiple ones, and what's the function? Well, those additional MCM double hexamers serve as a backup. Um, when the fork becomes terminally blocked, you know, then you can reactivate uh, one of those double hexamers and form a new fork. So this is a very elegant way to uh, uh, deal with those kind of problems, and why does this exist? Well, in S phase, you cannot load again a new double hexamer on top of DNA. So you must do the job in G1. You must load enough of them to get through S phase. So even if one gets completely blocked, then you have an extra one that you then can activate and then get through any kind of trouble. So, all right. So we were asking the question, really, how is the MCM double hexamer assembled? So the initial model um, by our competition was it becomes loaded in a concerted process as a double hexamer on top of DNA. And we said, OK, I mean, could be true, could be true. But then um, we, we wondered, uh, uh, maybe one should actually look at this in a careful way and let, and let the data speak about it. So we we said, OK, so what happens in the absence of ATP hydrolysis? Could we look for an intermediate? And then we may be able to see uh, how this process works. And we kind of went on to the hunt for intermediates in MCM double hexamer formation. So the first one was a relatively simple one. So we used ATP gamma S, which kind of can be only hydrolyzed extremely slowly. And we kind of said, OK, so what happens in the presence of ATP gamma S and ATP in respect of complex assembly? And as you can see, you, you get kind of MCM recruited to DNA in each scenario. However, if you apply this kind of high salt wash, what you see right away is that in the presence of ATP, you form this double hexamer. And in, in, in the absence uh, of ATP hydrolysis, this complex becomes very salt sensitive. So this MCM must be in a different conformation than that MCM, right? So there must be, this must be some form of intermediate. And we were very, very happy with this experiment and said, OK, so now let's look at this complex a bit more. What, what is it composed of? And so we, 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 were, we were thinking, OK, so maybe we can cross-link it and study it uh, uh, in a gel. And you know, this is a typical boss idea, maybe you know, suggesting this to the postdoc. And the postdoc, uh, not better knowing, says, yeah, sounds reasonable. But um, if you ever have tried to resolve a million Dalton-sized complex on a gel, 
and then you will notice that this is, is, is very, very tricky because your gel is almost liquid to dissolve, uh, sorry, that it enters such a big complex in the DNA. And it was really tricky to get the conditions right. And the postdoc, uh, Cecile, she was really, really good. So she managed to, to get around that. Anyway, this is, uh, so we did crosslinking experiments. And this is our kind of marker proteins. This is org uncrosslink. This is MCM uncrosslink. This is org crosslink. So you, you get uh, this larger complex. And you, you see probably some. Uh, dimer or aggregation or something. This is MCM on, on its own crosslink, so this is probably the single hexamer. And then when we had the whole reaction in the presence of ATP, so the pre-RC assembly, we saw a new species arriving and this was much bigger than the single hexamer up here. And when we applied the high salt wash, then only this kind of species was observed. So that kind of told us, okay, that must be the double hexamer. That's very nice. And then in the presence of ATP gamma S, we had a new species of complex that we haven't seen in, in at all. So, so that was very exciting for us. We, we had an intermediate. And uh, yeah, so then what does it contain? So then we said, okay, so let's try to rest them lot that. And a few weeks later, after optimizing rest them lot conditions, we could actually rest them lot it. And so this is our control. This is a, a MCM double hexamer, and this contains MCM and no org and no CD1 or no CD6. However, our intermediate contains not only MCM, but also ORC and also CD21 and also CTC6. So we were jumping up and down for joy. We were extremely happy, so we got our intermediate. But then the real question was, okay, so how many MCMs are in there, right? Because there was a model, okay, it's a concerted process, there should be two MCMs. And, um, but I mean, the complex was running smaller than the double hexamer, so uh, it has to, be, has to be really strange if it would be two. But we said, okay, we, we, we measure it, okay? And so the way to measure uh, a dimerization of MCMs or double hexamer formation is uh, done in this way. We have a copy of MCM that has a maltose binding protein tag and another copy that has no tag. And then you form complexes with those mixed populations and you ask, is there, uh, uh, in the end product, it, um, if you IP this MVP, then is there co-IP of untagged MCM or not, right? Uh, untagged MCM or not in the core IP. So this is what, what, what we did, and this is the result. So this is our positive control. We did a reaction in the presence of ATP, where we know that the double hexamer forms, and we have an input, which has the tagged MCM, or the tagged and the untagged MCM, or only the untagged MCM, and the IP with the tagged MCM, we pull down untagged MCM. So double hexamer should have uh, so, uh, two different versions of MCM in there. So that's, that's working brilliantly. And then in the presence of ATP gamma S, what we observed, again, our input. And so we have uh, tagged and the mixture untagged. And in the IP, we don't see co-IP of the uh, untagged MCM. So this only contains a single hexamer. So that was... Uh, proof, uh, but it contains CD21 and ORC and CD6 because it's an intermediate. All right, good. So, so we, were, we could conclude that in the absence of ATP hydrolysis, we could uh, CD21 and single MCM hexamer. And then um, we had the next question. OK, so maybe, um, and that was actually then a few years later, we asked the question, OK, so could this, could this process already be, or could this MCM hexamer be already loaded at that stage? 
And in eukaryotes, you have six different MCMs. And we asked the question, OK, so if, um, if, if the ring becomes opened, at which interface does it become open? And um, we, we actually we came up with a fairly complicated strategy to uh, block DNA entry at uh, uh, interfaces of MCMs. And I don't want to go through all of this, because then you'll stay all afternoon here. So what I just can tell you that we found an individual interface between MCM2 and 5, which is essential for DNA entry into this kind of complex. And we could show that this single MCM hexamer is already loaded on top of DNA. Uh, and then we also published the cryo-EM structure of this complex, um, where DNA enters into the complex here. And this is the org CDC6 side. And then MCM goes in, sorry, DNA goes into the MCM part. And, and the exit side, I think, is still a bit of a, um, um, something that we have to define better. But it's very clear that DNA enters into the complex. OK, so um, what we conclude from this kind of work is that, OK, helicase loading occurs at the single hexamer stage. But then you still need to recruit a second MCM hexamer. Uh, and how does this? How does this work? And actually, all of this happened in the absence of ATP hydrolysis, which was also, I think, probably rather surprising. So what is an ATP hydrolysis good for? You know, you kind of always think it must be doing something really, really important. And um, what it does is it ejects CD21. And, um, and, 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 then, and then what? So we, we characterize this next <coughs> intermediate, uh, and this is actually an org CD6 MCM complex uh, containing still only single MCM. And why is this formed? So what we could show is that this complex is actually competent to recruit the second MCM hexamer, whereas this complex cannot recruit the second MCM hexamer. So what ATP hydrolysis does, it ejects CD1 and then uh, mm, kind of changes the conformation of the complex, and now it becomes an adapter for the second MCM. And in a CD21 dependent process, you can load the second MCM, and then you form a double hexamer. And um, this is how you load the double hexamer. But I was telling you, OK, so why is this reaction then so efficient? And how can you block the reaction? So there were two, two reasons for that. So one reason is this um, ORC and CDC6 um, ATP hydrolysis reaction. So that you have actually two ATPases that are involved in the release of, of CD21. And the reaction is probably so efficient because you have two proteins that are actually kind of motoring, changing the structure of ORC CDC6 to produce this complex. And then the second part, the inhibition, I want to show you one, one interesting experiment that we did. So we, we kind of, um, so CD, we, we asked the question, how does CDK, the primary inhibitor of pre rc formation, how does CDK affect this cascade of events? And we asked the question, OK, so if you phosphorylate the origin recognition complex, can you still recruit MCM? Or actually, maybe it blocks it already at this early stage. And what we found is that in the absence of ATP hydrolysis, so let me talk, see how the experiment goes here. We have initially ORC, which is unphosphorylated. And then we have increasing concentration of CDK added. And you get phosphorylation of ORC. You get a phosphor shift here in ORC2 and phosphor shift in ORC6. Um, and so then we have here an experiment where we uh, form the complex in the presence of ATP gamma S without ATP hydrolysis. And uh, obviously, this works. And then the phosphorylated ORC actually can still form the same kind of complex in the presence of ATP gamma S. So you can still recruit MCM and CD21. 
However, then if you let ATP hydrolysis go on, what happens is this OCM complex, so the product of ATP hydrolysis where CD2 on is released, this becomes highly sensitive and actually falls apart. Okay, so let me show you on a, on a slide uh, how this works. So you phosphorylate the R complex, then you let ATP hydrolysis occur, CD2 on gets released, and then you f this complex becomes heavily destabilized in the presence of uh, phosphorylation. So for me, that was a really cool experiment because it shows a small modification on ARC can lead to a complete disassembly of this complex. So if you think about you want to inhibit a process, you know, you want to create this, this drug that maybe could affect cancer cells, then, you know, you can kind of imagine, okay, maybe Maybe we have a fighting chance here that we find something that could emulate this phosphorylation event and do the same thing. Okay, all right. So now we come to some structures and um, more electron microscopy structures. And this slide is here to remind me that all of those uh, electron microscopy is done with Swilling Li, who is in Brookhaven, New York and has been a fantastic collaboration and we looked at uh, single hexamers um, where you can make up a single subunit of the MCM here and then another one there and we looked at the, at the double hexamers which are 1.2 million Dalton beasts and um, I'll be talking a bit more about the double hexamer because there are a number of interesting observations all right, so um, the structure of the MCM double hex mass, so this is uh, just a, a negative stain uh, uh, picture of the double hex mass, and uh, it's 20 nanometers or so long, covers 50, 60 base pairs of DNA. And um, we used a multiple binding approach to identify in this uh, complex the individual subunits. So what the, the trouble with that was it, you can't just fuse Marto's binding protein to the N or C terminal of the MCM subunits because it would inactivate their loading ability. So what we had to do instead is, you know, if you take the MCM, we inserted it somewhere in the middle of the MVP either in the N-terminal section or the C-terminal section. And um, after some trial and error, we found sites where we could do that. And that worked then quite well, because um, in the M, then we could see the MVP quite well. So this is MVP uh, on the N-terminals of MCM2 or on the C-terminals of MCM2. You can, you can see it in the... Um, this is 2D averages or in the 3D map uh, or for the other MCMs. So, so that was really, really neat. And then uh, with that, we could kind of uh, assign uh, the different subunits to this kind of uh, double hexamer map. And um, if you think about the double hexamer, you have to think about, OK, so I was telling you about the gate. This 2-5 gate for opening. So we, I mean, if you assume that this gate also functions for helicase activation, then you have to think about, initially you load the double hexamer on double-stranded DNA, but the CMG, the CDC45 genes MCM complex functions in the context of single-stranded DNA. So what that means is you, you need to somehow open up this MCM double hexamer take one strand out and then close it again. So that's, that's a, a quite a mind-blowing reaction. So we were thinking, okay, so how will that work? Because if you have those two five gates uh, in a specific confirmation, then you could come up with different models. And we came up with a model A and model B. So model A is two five gates are nicely uh, aligned to each other. And then what could happen is you could just open it up and remove the DNA. Or the uh, gates are offset. So either you open it up and then can deal with the DNA, or you 
have them offset and then you need to separate first and then you could open up. Okay, so we wanted to understand how this process works so we just looked into the double XMA and asked where are the two five gates orientated and what we found to our surprise is that they are actually offset. So they are offset here MCM2, MCM5, MCM2, MCM5. So that means you, you can't just open them up like a, uh, like a sandwich or a hot dog. You, you, uh, you probably need to separate them first because those inter subunit interactions will block DNA entry, uh, sorry, will block uh, opening of the MCM ring. All right, so this was one interesting observation. And uh, so we can conclude that this model is wrong and this model is right. So we, we have some offset, we separate the hexamers and then we can open. All right, um, another interesting observation was uh, the way the subunits are arranged. So um, here you have a single MCM hexamer and the subunits are arranged in this kind of linear process. Within the double hexamer, they're actually in the tilted conformation. So, so what is the tilt doing? Why, why is it there? And we, what, what we speculated was, okay, so if you tilt the subunits, something happens to them. So the MCM is an ATPase, and it's actually a composite ATPase, so where you have the uh, ATP Mm, some of the ATP binding and hydrolysis motifs on one subunit and then an important alginine finger required for ATP hydrolysis in the, in the uh, adjacent subunit. So if you tilt this conformation, what will happen is that you will uncouple the ATP hydrolysis motifs, right? And so we had this model and then we said, okay, so let's measure the ATP hydrolysis. And indeed, the single hexamer has much more ATP hydrolysis than, than the double hexamer. So th that's, a, um, that's a way to block MCM double hexamer activity. So this double hexamer uh, um, needs to be initially inactive, and you only want to activate it later in S phase. So this is a very powerful mechanism to block it and to keep it inactive. And, and so you can say there are all sorts of inactivating mechanisms. So you can't open the MCM ring easily. The ATP hydrolysis is blocked. I mean, this is as dead uh, in, in the water as you can be. But we also found a very good way to activate it. Um, so this DDK kinase, I was telling you in the very beginning that this is kind of a key factor in activating the ATPase, sorry, the MCM complex. And this uh, DDK kinase consists of CDC7 and db 4 And db 4 contacts MCM2 and CDC7 and MCM4 and also a bit of MCM5. And if you think about, okay, so one contacts two and then you contact four and then you contact five, and this enzyme isn't so big, how can it be at all those different places at the same time? However, in the double hexamer, actually, all of those sites come nicely together in a nice patch. So that explains now quite well that, you know, you have two, five, and four directly adjacent to each other. So DDK should activate this complex much better than the double hex than the single hexamer. So we measured the uh, uh, activity of DDK on top of the single hexamer and the double hexamer, and you can see here in the uh, silver stain you get a nice phosphor shift for MCM6 in case of the double hexamer, and you also see the in uh, at the P32 level a much uh, stronger phosphorylation. So. Yeah, so that's a neat way how you can have a really inactive complex, but by generating this double hexamer interface, you create a surface that allows specific activation of this complex. So, okay, so in summary, the uh, uh, double hexamer is inactive because it encircles double stranded DNA, the gates are offset, blocking MCM ring opening. The subunits are twisted to uncouple ATP hydrolysis, but then the complex can be primed for activation by DDK kinase. 
Jews are the most important people that um, because they have done the work. So Stefan was involved in generating many of those MVP constructs, and he was also the person who worked on this MCM gate story and has done an absolutely brilliant job. Alejandra worked on the OCM complex, and she had a bit of help with Alberto, and who was also key uh, for the MCM double XML story that I was talking about. And Christian created some really important mutants for us. And yeah, thank you very much. This is a, a collaborators, uh, internal and external collaborators, and those people for funding. Thank you. <laughs>